So, good morning. Today our text is John chapter 10, verse 7 through 10. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the parable of the Good Shepherd. So, John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10 are going to be our section for today. It says this. <clears throat> So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So, in the winter of 1992, the McAllister family planned to escape the miserable cold of the city of Chicago by spending Christmas in sunny Florida. Uh, The tickets were purchased, reservations were made, uh, uh, bags were packed, they had scheduled their airport shuttle, and all there was left to do was to wake up early the next morning and head to the airport. It's pretty simple. Everything is ready. Next morning, the family of 14 is rushing around because they overslept. But they manage to board the shuttles in time, and the McAllisters arrive to the right airport, to the right terminal, just in time. So the time of their flight is fast approaching, and the airport is packed with holiday travelers. Everybody wants to go somewhere for the holiday. So the McAllisters are flying through the airport in a hurry. They are running toward the one gate through which they will board the airplane that will transport them to the paradise that we call Florida. But little Kevin, the youngest kid, he's having trouble to keep up with them. He is, he's shorter, he's, you know, he's, he's struggling. So he's following his father and he sees him at a very short distance. His father is wearing this beautiful beige winter coat. So Kevin is trying to follow and not lose his father, but in the blink of an eye, this poor little kid loses sight of his his father. So obviously, you're a little kid. You're frantically looking for your father. You're in the middle of an airport that is packed, surrounded by strangers, and he's trying desperately to find him again. And just in a few seconds, boom, he makes contact again. He sees his father wearing that beautiful uh, uh, winter coat, and then he sees this guy walking into a gate and into an airplane. So <clears throat> Kevin runs toward him, and makes it to the gate and into the plane with just seconds to spare. Right after they close the door, before actually, not after. Now they were actually closing the door, I think. And then uh, <clears throat> he makes it in. The point is that um, this is not a happy ending story. Unfortunately, Kevin followed the wrong leader that led him through the wrong door into the wrong plane that was not taking him to sunny Florida. He was going to New York. So I think this was a real story, but my wife insists that this is the plot of a movie. But for our illustration today, this works perfectly because our lesson today speaks about something that is very similar. Following the wrong leader and entering through the wrong door will lead you to the mice. So <clears throat> in my previous lesson in John chapter 10, I mentioned in th- that in the five first verses of this chapter, we saw that this was a figure of speech. And this figure of speech was addressed to the Jews, and the purpose was to explain to them the difference between a false shepherd and a true shepherd. So that's what's happening in the fi- first five verses uh, in, in, in this chapter, just as a reminder. And then we also said that the Jews did not really understand what Jesus had been saying to them. They, they, they got the picture, they got the story, but they were not really sure of what Jesus meant. So now the Lord proceeds to expand with what was said before. And this is evident from the very beginning of verse seven, which is where we begin our study this morning. So, there's a conjunction here, if you, know, if you notice in verse 7, it says, uh, So Jesus said to them again, 
Other versions might have, say, uh, uh, might have something like therefore. And the point of the conjunction so or therefore is uh, making the point that this is an explanation or in this case an expansion of what Jesus had previously stated. So verse seven says, therefore Jesus said to them again, truly, truly I say to you, some other version says, I tell you the truth, or if you have the King James, it says, verily, verily. But the point here, just as in verse 1, is that Jesus is again calling attention to the fact that he is about to say something that is really important. So in other words, he's telling, telling them something like, listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. This is something very important. Pay attention. I'm going to expand. I'm going to explain to you what I just said. So Jesus continues in verse 7, saying, I am the door of the sheep. Now, if you remember, back in verse 1 of this same chapter, we saw that the fold of the sheep was an enclosure that was made with, uh, <clears throat> with rocks, and it, was, it had walls 7 to 10 feet high, and the purpose of this sheepfold was to keep the sheep safe at night from robbers, from thieves, and from, you know, wild beasts. And there was only one entrance to the sheepfold. So both shepherds and sheep must enter and exit through that one door. There's no other way to come in, just one door. Then in verse 10, of chapter, in verse 2, I'm sorry, Jesus identified himself as the true shepherd who enters through the, through the door. He enters the sheepfold through the door. So <clears throat> he doesn't need to illegally climb the wall from the back or from the side. Jesus goes into the, you know, through the front, front door because he came to the fold of Israel lawfully. He has nothing to fear. He is entitled to go through the door. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the true shepherd of the sheep. Therefore, he goes through the door. Now, with this in mind, we would have expected that in this section, we're going to hear an explanation of the function of Jesus as shepherd. But that is actually not the case. In these verses, instead, the Lord introduces a new thought. He gives us a new idea. And he says in verse 7, I am the door. So with this statement, Jesus applies this idea of the door of the sheep to himself. So this thought is very similar to what we see in John chapter 1, verse 51, where Jesus is the ladder connecting heaven and earth. And this idea is also similar to what we see in John 14, 6, where Jesus is the way. However, here what we have is the imagery of the fold of the sheep. Now, what Jesus is emphatically telling us in verse 7 is that he is the door. There's an emphasis there. He is the door. And through him, the sheep enter the safety of God's fold. So if the sheep are to enter into blessing, they must enter through Jesus. That's the point of this. Then in verse 8, Jesus proceeds to contrast himself with his predecessors. He says in verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, <clears throat> Jesus is not speaking about the great patriarchs or the prophets that came before him. He's not speaking about Moses. He's not speaking about David or Isaiah or all these other men that we're reading in the scriptures because these are true and faithful servants of God. He's not talking about them. Instead, the thieves and robbers were hostile enemies of the shepherds. And these hostile enemies were seeking to steal the sheep and take them away with violence. These were not friends of the sheep. These were enemies, and they were seeking to harm them. So the thieves and robbers then are the Jewish religious establishment of his day. Who were these leaders? Well, it was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. So these religious leaders could not care any less for the well-being of the sheep. All they care about was their own gain. 
And these religious leaders will follow shepherds because they did not come from God. God did not send them there to take care of the sheep. These guys are false shepherds. These guys were not seeking to give anything to the sheep. That was not what they wanted. They wanted to take. They wanted to take as much as they could from them. So <clears throat> their motivation was not love. They were not motivated by service. They were not motiva motivated by sacrifice. Their actual motivation was cruelty, greed, and selfishness. They were looking only for themselves, nothing for the sheep. False shepherds existed then, and unfortunately, they continue to exist today. They just look a little bit different. In America, and all around the world, there are thousands of churches where the gospel has never been preached. There are pseudo-pastors who write book after book just to tell the people what they want to hear, but they don't tell them what they need to hear. They talk about an imaginary God who is loving, who is forgiving, who is inclusive, who is accepting of all people. Everybody can come in, everybody's welcome. It doesn't matter what the state of your spiritual, what your spiritual state is, it doesn't matter what's happening in your heart, you're just welcome. Just come in here and God will embrace you just like you are. This God will give everything and anything to these people just because they're nice, just because they're good people. And just because they give to the church, they deserve of every blessing. So that's, that's what they promise. So these, these, these people are, are telling people, everything is rosy, everything is peachy, there's butterflies and rainbows everywhere. But they will never talk to you about sin and its consequences. That is what we need to hear. They will never talk about sin because that is distasteful. It is unpopular and it is bad for business. So we, we don't want people to know that. These false shepherds will not only talk about, will not talk about our fallen condition. They will not talk about our absolute inability to satisfy the righteousness of God. They will not tell you that you're dead in, in your sins and you desperately need a savior. That is what we need to know. We need to know we're in danger. We need to know we're enemies of God. We know that we cannot save ourselves. We need to know that we must have a savior. But you won't hear that from them. Why would they tell you that? Their only concern is fame and profit. They seek the approval of the world, and that's why you have tons of churches and pastors who will not only accept, but affirm everything that the Bible condemns. So that's why you have churches and religious leaders that embrace social movements, that embrace flags that make statements about gender. That's what they're doing. They're seeking the approval of the world not the approval of God. But the sheep did not hear them then, and the sheep will not hear them now. Back in verse 5, we saw that the sheep will not follow a person who is not their shepherd. In fact, the sheep would run away from him because they do not, they don't recognize his voice. They will run away from this person because they do not know who he is, and most importantly, they do not trust him. The true sheep will not follow a false shepherd. So true Christians will not run after false teachers. Believers will not believe a false gospel because they have spiritual discernment. That's the key reason. We might be deceived because of course we can all be, but it's not gonna be forever. At some point, you will realize, you will wake up and realize this, this is wrong and I cannot do this. That's, that's just that simple. Now I need to stop here for a moment and say something to my young students and for all those new believers or young believers that might be listening to this message. What you need to know is that it will take time to learn the voice of the true shepherd. And it would also take time and practice and effort 
to develop spiritual discernment. This is not going to happen overnight. There is a process, and there is certain effort that needs to be put into this endeavor. And what you also need to know is that it is, this is an essential skill. Spiritual discernment is an essential skill that you will use for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, we are living in an era where information and entertainment are readily available. It's everywhere, everywhere. It's, it, it can be easily accessed. And what you need to know is that the world wants to capture your attention. It wants to influence your thoughts, and it wants to influence your beliefs. The world wants to shape your mind and your heart. Satan wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be isolated, and he wants you to be hopeless by making you doubt that God is good and that the Bible is true. The evil one wants you to believe that sin must be accepted in the name of love and in the name of justice. So if you're a truly loving young person, you must affirm the sin of those around you. That is not what the Bible teaches. And these, and, 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 and even worse ideas, are present in your schools, are present in your neighborhood, are present with your friends, in entertainment, in your music, in your social media, you name it. It is everywhere, everywhere. If you've been watching the Olympics, there was a very, very defined agenda that was being pushed every night. Normalization of sin was in the forefront of every broadcast. And young people were the target. So if you want to recognize the voice of our Savior, it is imperative that you spend time reading the Bible. Reading as in actually wanting to know what it says. It is imperative that you spend time studying it, like really getting acquainted with it. And you must meditate upon it. What is it that this is saying? How is this applying to my life? How does this look in real life? That's what you need to know. And you must also spend time listening to the word preached. When you come here, you don't come here to sleep. You come to a class. You come prepared to be instructed. And also, you need to have fellowship with the saints. You need to surround yourself with other believers, with people that, will, that is of, like, of a like mind, and that will be able to pray with you, and that will be able to encourage you in the faith. Nothing that is more important in your life than your relationship with God. Because your personal relationship with the Savior is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. That's how serious this is. Now, to the parents, which are most of us here, and to the teachers, we, you and I, have been called to shepherd these young people. We have been, been entrusted with these sheep, and they need our protection and our guidance, both physical and spiritual. The Lord told us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is, this is a scary thought right here. And let me ask you this. Has any one of you been following the news lately? 
Have you been on social media? Because there are myriads, myriads of articles, tweets, YouTube videos, TikTok videos, uh, uh, Instagram posts, you name it, that make it very clear. They make it very clear in no uncertain terms that Satan wants our children and he is coming for them. There is one video of a particular group that said, we are coming for your children. And they explain it away as they're trying to be cheeky, whatever that means, it's gonna be funny, but that is not funny. Because the ideas that they're promoting are satanic. And they did say, we're coming for your children. So it is up to you and I to lead these children to Christ. It is up to us to teach them the scriptures. And it is up to us to help them develop this skill of spiritual discernment that they desperately need in order to be out there in the world, surrounded by wolves and lions and snakes. Now, back to our text. In verse 9, the Lord expands this idea of the door of the sheep. If you remember back in verse 7, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. But here the Lord simply says, I am the door. And this is a very significant phrase that requires us to look at the original language, which I'm going to do very carefully because Dr. Ladwig is in attendance, and I don't want to hear from him later. So here we go. What I want to say first is that there is, as I was saying, there's an emphasis. And the emphasis here in, verse, in this verse is the pronoun, the personal pronoun, I. And I think, unless I'm corrected later, but I think that the emphasis is lost in translation, and it is possibly due to grammatical correctness. So let me explain. The Greek uh, phrase says, ego eimi heithura, which means, in English, as our translation says, I am the door. However, a word-by-word -word translation yields a slightly different translation that when I tell it to you, you're going to see, well, that's grammatically incorrect. But even in its incorrectness, you can see here clearly the emphasis that I'm talking about. So the translation says, I, I am the door. That would be the translation. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But the idea here is I and I alone am the door. So that's the idea. I and I alone, me and no one else, I and I alone am the door. So I want you to notice here that there's an exclusiveness. There is a specificity about our salvation. There is only one door. There is only one way to be saved. Just like Kevin McAllister, there was only one plane that was at that one door that was going to take him to his destination. One door, one airplane, one destination. Same thing here. There is only one person. There is only one door to that one destination. And what the Lord Jesus is making here uh, very clear is two things. The first is that there are no multiple methods of salvation. Unfortunately, there are many people who think that there are several ways to get to heaven. There are those who believe that, <clears throat> that they can access heaven through virgins and saints. And the sad part of it all is that these are, this includes self-proclaimed Christians that say Jesus is not the only way. These people also think that they, they can access salvation, they can earn their salvation with works and prayer. But the Apostle Peter says that they're absolutely wrong. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Peter is saying, there's not more than one way. There's only one way. There's only one Savior, not multiple. That's it. Now, the second implication that Jesus is making here is that it matters. It really matters who you believe in. Throughout history, we have seen the appearance of many religions and many gods throughout the centuries in several places of the earth. And there are some that wrongly claim that all religions, all of them, all of them, without an exception, they all worship the same God, 
only with different names. So if you're uh, uh, worshiping Allah, yeah, I mean, you call him Allah, but in reality, he is God. That, that, is, not, that is not true. That's not what it is. The triune God of the universe does not go by different names in different regions, in different places, or at different times. The reality is that there is only one God, and that God is the God of the Bible. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one essence. And this God, which is the only God, revealed himself to us through his written word, which is the scriptures, and through his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the one and only true God. And Jesus himself tells us here in verse 8, I am the door. I and only I am the door. And then he adds in verse 9, if anywhere, anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, in order to understand and appreciate the gift of salvation, we must never forget that each and every human being is born a sinner. All of us are born sinners. And the consequence of our sin is death. Furthermore, all enemies, all, all, all sinners are enemies of God. That is very serious. And as enemies of God, we deserve of his wrath. And the worst of it all is that there is nothing that we can do to change our fallen condition. That's what we need to hear. That is why we need a savior. And what Jesus is telling us here is that he is the door to salvation. And he's the door to salvation from the consequences of sin. He's going to save us from the consequences of our sin. He's going to save us from the wrath of God. Jesus is the only door into eternal life. And those who enter through him will not only be protected, they will also be free from the bondage of sin. And all our needs will be satisfied forever. Forever. You will not want. You will not need. You will not suffer. Everything is taken care of forever if you come to the Lord Jesus. I believe that a good illustration of all this can be found in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. And if you're familiar, of course you are, uh, with this section of the scriptures, this is where God commands Noah to build an ark in order to survive the wrath that is about to be poured from heaven in the form of flooding and, from, and in the form of rain. So I understand that a whole sermon can be uh, uh, preached about this, but today I just want to make a few points that are relevant to our study. So when Noah built the ark, something is very important to consider is that he did not build it however he thought it was best. He did not build the ark however it made more sense to him, however he thought it was easier. Noah did not did that. Noah did exactly as God told him to do. Noah built the ark according to the specific and detailed instructions that he got from God. There's two ways of doing things, my way or the Lord's way. But only one of those is correct, and that's what Noah did. Noah did it however God told him to do. And among these precise instructions that Noah received from God was that the ark had no sails, no oars, and no rudder, rudder. So what does that mean? What it means is that Noah had absolutely no control over the movements of the ark. He had no control over it. The other thing that was very peculiar and is the ark had only one door. This is a massive ship. ship. They have one life size in Kentucky. It's a museum. And they built another one not long ago, and um, I think it was in Holland, and they were trying to move it to um, England. But the Coast Guard seized it because they did not consider it seaworthy. That tells us the Coast Guard says this, this, this cannot go into sea. This is not safe. But if, if Noah built this without any control over it, that means that even God was holding it. He was making it float. God was in absolute control of everything there, which is amazing. That's what, that, that when I read that, that made me think about that. But there was only one door to go in and only one door to go out in this massive sheep. That should sound familiar. One door, one way in, one way out. 
And then after that, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, we see that after everything is in there, after all the water, the, the, the food and the hay, everything that we're going to need was inside the ark, Noah and his family, and the animals go into the ark, and it is God himself who closes the door behind them. And what that means is that all of those who are inside the ark are the ones who God chose to be inside the ark. So... <clears throat> God is, he was, and he is the one who decides who is saved and who is not. No one went in that ark without God saying so. So <clears throat> the flood comes, and then we read that the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. All the living things that were on dry land died, the water rose over 23 feet above the highest peak, which in this day and era is the Everest. 23 feet higher than the Everest, the water completely covered the surface of the earth. And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now I think about this for a moment. <clears throat> this had to be a very violent storm. The amount of water that rushed from the depths of the earth and fell from the sky the speed with which the water came and the time that it stayed over the surface of the earth made it impossible, impossible for anyone to survive. God made sure that no one would make it out alive from this disaster. But in the same way that God ensured the destruction of his enemies, he also ensured the safety of those who, who were inside the ark. Or he ensured the safety of those whom he chose to be saved. Those who entered the ark were saved from the raging flood, and God satisfied all their needs from the very beginning to the very end of the event. And the same thing can be said about the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 9. All those who are in him are protected from the wrath of God that is poured on his enemies. In Christ, we have absolute protection. We have peace and reconciliation with the Father. We have freedom from the bondage of sin. And we have eternal life. And this life is abundant. We have abundant provision in the Lord. That's the parallel there. Now, back in our text, the Lord concludes this section saying in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now here the Lord is making a contrast between him and the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Now remember, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes were powerful, evil opponents powerful, evil opponents of Jesus who were threatening the safety of the sheep. They did not care for the sheep. They cared about themselves. And their purpose was to steal and kill and destroy the flock. Remember, these people are not from God. As I mentioned before, these false shepherds will blatantly disregard the word of God for their own personal gain, just like today. I don't care what the Bible says. I am going to go the other way because this is going to put me in, 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 uh, in good graces with the world. These false shepherds were leading people through a dangerous path that would ultimately end in suffering and destruction, which is the same thing that happens today. They're selling an idea of a false love. They're selling an idea of false justice. If you do not know God, you do not know love, you do not know justice. What they preach is not what the Bible says, but they don't care. In contrast, Jesus offers protection. He came to give spiritual life to those who believe in him. The Lord concludes this uh, verse 10 saying that if the, 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 the life that he gives is abundant, Okay, there, 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 is, there is an emphasis on, 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 that I want to make in this word. This abundancy means that it's far beyond what we need. It's more than I actually require to survive. So <clears throat> there's a section in Matthew in chapter 14 that is going to be helping, uh, help us 
to illustrate this point of the abundant provision. This section in Matthew 14 is found in verses 13 through 21. And it is known as the feeding of the 5,000. Maybe some of your Bibles would have that subtitle in it. And this offers a, a, one of many, many great illustrations, but this is the one that came to my, to my mind as I was writing this. And this is illustrating the Lord's abundant provision. And the subtitle, as I was saying, of this, uh, of this section, the, the feeding of the 5,000 is actually deceiving. Because if you look in verse 21, it says that they were 5,000 men plus women and children. So it's really not 5,000. It's more like 20,000. Probably more, probably a little bit less, but around 20,000. And, and, and it, since this is this, uh, as a massive number of people, let me give you a, a, a visual to, so you can get some perspective. So imagine the American Airlines Center filled to capacity, okay? Sold out crowd, that's how many people were there. 20,000. Double A Center, which sounds really bad. American Airlines Center filled to capacity. That's how many people were following Jesus that, that, that day. So this massive crowd followed Jesus to a desolate place. It's nothing, nothing out there. And it was late, and they were, the people were tired. They were hungry. They had been walking all day in the sun, you know, through difficult terrain. They're tired, they're hungry, and there's nothing around. So <clears throat> they have no food to eat. I mean, you, you, they weren't expecting to be out there that long and that far. So the Lord, seeing this, the Lord Jesus decides to feed them all. And he orders everyone to take a seat on the ground, on the grass, and he takes five loaves and two fish that someone had, depending on the gospel. Uh, uh, someone will say that it was a little child, whatever. But the, po the point is that, you know, there's five uh, uh, loaves of bread and two fish. They bring him to the Lord. And then Jesus looks up toward heaven. He blesses the food and he breaks the loaves. And then <clears throat> he gives them to his disciples. And the disciples start passing the food around. They start feeding the people. And the people ate and they were satisfied. That's what scripture says. They ate and they were satisfied. So what we need to understand is that this was not a little snack that you would give to your child when you're on your way from A to B and he won't stop screaming and you say, okay, here, just suck on this while we get there, all right, to appease you. That's not what this is. This is a feast. The Lord provide food for these people that ate until they were full. They could not take another bite. That's what this means. This, this eating and be satisfied is they ate till they could no more. So after Jesus provides food for 20,000 people who ate until they were absolutely satisfied, okay? 20,000 people. Imagine the, the amount of food that you need. If you have organized a wedding and you have invited 50 people, you know that that's a lot of food. Imagine 20,000 people, all right? So everybody has eaten. They can eat no more. And they still had 12 baskets full of leftover. I don't know what's the size of the baskets, but I'm assuming that it might have been big baskets. And the point of this is that there was a surplus. The food that there the, the was provided, they had a surplus of the food. So the Lord provided way more than was needed for these people to be satisfied. He provided abundantly. That's the whole point. That's how this ties to this provision that I'm talking about. An ordinary man like you and I would be utterly incapable of doing any of these things. It would be impossible. No man could, uphold, could make and uphold the promises that Jesus made. But what you need to understand is that Jesus is not an ordinary man. He is not like us. He is not like us. You see, Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is God incarnate. Now, I'm not the one who say, who's saying that. He says so himself. And he says it seven times in the Gospel of John, to be precise. He says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, 9, which is our text, I am the door. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John 11:25, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. 
John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 15, 5, I am the vine. Now, what, what, what's the deal here? He's just saying that he is. The phrase that he's using back in Greek, it's ego e me. I and I alone. I am. So these seven I am, ego e me statements find their origin and their relevance in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, when God is telling Moses, Moses, you go tell my people that I'm coming to save them very soon. And then before Moses leaves, he says, hey, Lord, so I want to go talk to them, but what do I say when they ask me what is his name? And God says to Moses, ego e mi ho on, which means I am who I am. So you go tell the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You see the I am, ego e mi, is the same phrase, I am. So from the very beginning, Jesus has been telling them and us that he himself is God incarnate. He says it many times. This is just one example. There's another section when he tells the, the Pharisees, before Abraham was born, I am. And they knew right there and then he's making himself God. He, he's saying he's God, and that's why they picked up stones and they were trying to kill him. They were going to kill him because he was blaspheming, saying, I am God. They knew it. Every time they heard, the, 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 their ears were ringing. That was the, that's the situation. He has been telling us that he himself is God. Jesus is the only door to salvation, the only door to eternal life, the door through which we access the Father. There is no other way to access God the Father. Jesus promises protection, freedom, and eternal life to those, those to come to him in faith. So, if you're here without Christ, it is the Lord that invites you to come to him and receive the free gift of salvation that you could never obtain on your own. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you came to die for sinners. We ask you, Lord, that is, if there's anyone that has not believed in you, that you would take a hold of their hearts and allow them to believe in order to be saved. And for those who have received this gift, we ask you, Lord, that you would allow us to um, cherish this gift and worship you the way we, we must, to <clears throat> have a renewed heart to follow you and worship you. And Lord, we ask for your protection in these dangerous times, these difficult times that you would allow the young ones, especially the young ones, to have spiritual discernment and allow us older people to be of service, to have a ministry to those who are younger, to those who are newer in the faith, that we may be able to um, honor you and serve you as we must. In Jesus' name, amen.